would like to welcome you to the Amazon Research Center for Ornamental Fishes lecture series. Our, our goal is to have speakers who will focus on the various aspects of fish care, conservation, sustainability, and breeding. Uh, my name is Dr. Anthony Mazaro. I am the executive director of the Research Center. Uh, the format for the next hour will be the presentation by our presenter, followed by questions from the attendees. Uh, please add your questions to the chat box. Uh, and we'll have a we'll have a scribe who will be transcribing those questions so I can answer them. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Monica Bone. Uh, Monica has over 10 years experience of monitoring the status and trends of biodiversity. Moni has worked extensively with the IUCN, has become a self-confessed taxonomic jack of all trades. Uh, after initially studying mammals in a primarily terrestrial setting, she has subsequently branched out to focus on the precarious status of the often overlooked, unprecedented, yet ecological important species groups of the world, such as reptiles, mollusks, dung beetles, and spiders, all of which are known as the non-charismatic species, as opposed to elephants, lions, and tigers, the big charismatic species. At the same time, her research interests became increasingly aquatic, and she has recently taken over the role of the freshwater conservation coordinator at the Global Center for Species Survival at the Atlant at the Indianapolis Zoo. Uh, previously based uh, at the Zoological Society of London, uh, Mania has been involved in other globally important initiatives. One is the Living Planet Index, which is a global biodiversity indicator, which tracks the world's progress towards international biodiversity conservation targets and takes center stage at the World Wildlife, Found, world Wildlife Fund's Living Planet Report. Also, the Edge of Existence Program, which promotes research and conservation action for evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered species. I present to you, Dr. Bond. Thanks very much, um, Anthony, for the lovely um, introduction. I feel you've already, um, you know, um, started to set up my talk very nicely for me. Um, so I hope you can all see my screen now. So I'm yep, yep. Moni Boom, as as Anthony said, and. Um, I am based at the Global Center for Species Survival, which is a new partnership between the Indianapolis Zoological Society and the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Species Survival Commission. Um, prior to that, as Anthony has already said, um, I'm very much coming from a terrestrial mammal background. Um, that was my first interest and, and, and love, really. Um, I studied badgers in the UK. Um, but then when I started at my previous job at the Zoological Society of London or CSL or CSL, um, really um, what I became more and more involved in is those species that are, that are less flashy, um, more overlooked, uh, underappreciated, but also some of the species that really play a massive part in the world's ecosystems um, in terms of making ecosystems function properly and so on. And so um, I do. I did try and make this as freshwater relevant as it's physically possible. There might be some marine and some terrestrial elements in there. Um, I hope you you forgive me. And um, uh, well, let's get started. Um, and happy happy World um, Environment Day, as well. Good time to have this presentation. Uh, and it doesn't move, there we go. So the first thing to start off with really is um, what is the IUCN and what is the Species Survival Commission? So the IUCN or the International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, has been is, is one of the oldest international um, conservation networks created in 1948. So, so already um, has got quite a few decades under its belt. And really the IUCN is probably primarily known for its flagship product, which is the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. 
which is essentially um, a way of classifying species extinction risk. Um, and really these red lists and the red data books have been going since um, about 60 years now. So really it is the flagship product of, of this organization. But of course it does much, much more. There's different commissions um, that, that work on other parts of of conservation, for example, looking at ecosystems or looking at protected areas, sustainable livelihoods, education, these kind of things, environmental law. Um, and as you can see, it's also the IUCN generally is also a really big beast. So many member organizations, generally states or government agencies or NGOs, lots of staff. And I personally think most, um, most incredibly these 16,000 or so commission experts, which are scientists and experts who, who give their time to the IUCN to, to inform and, and progress its work for, for conservation. Of these commissions that I've already mentioned, there's about six different commissions in the IUCN. Um, the largest by far is the Species Survival Commission. And under the Species Survival Commission, that's really where the IUCN red list sits best i.e. it's a red list of threatened species, so falls under the species conservation aspect of the IUCN. So the Species Survival Commission is a science-based network with more than 9,000 volunteer experts, mainly volunteer experts from around the world, and really includes a large variety of people working in research, in academia, in government, in zoos and botanic gardens, um, academic leaders, and so on. And the, the focus of the Species Survival Commission really is in its more than 160 specialist groups. Um, also then red list authorities, I already mentioned the one that I'm chairing, which is focusing on invertebrates uh, in the terrestrial and freshwater realm, for example, and, and various kind of more time bound task forces that look at specific issues. The specialist groups really range from anything from African elephant to freshwater fish, for example, um, um, also, of course, the butterflies that I already mentioned, and then various plant and fungal groups as well. So it's a it's a wide range of specialist groups across the taxon realm, as well as various cross-cutting issues, which are also interesting to freshwater systems, such as the invasive species specialist group, for example, or sustainable use and livelihood specialist group. So it's a very, very large network. And when we don't look at just the logos and try and put some faces to, to the mix, this is a a shot uh, taken at the latest um, leaders meeting of the Species Survival Commission, where the chairs of these various specialist groups convened to exchange ideas and drive forward the, the agenda really of the Species Survival Commission. So it's a, it's a large bunch of people and these are just the chairs, obviously the whole membership would not fit in a photo. So what is the background really to, to my work with the IUCN? And that really comes down to my work that I did at ZSL, which is looking at um, how we can best monitor biodiversity over time. Um, in the news, we're generally getting hit with the, the news that, that species are declining, species are at risk of extinction, um, declining in abundance. But really, it's very important that we keep um, that, that we devise metrics that really tell us something about the status and trend over time so that we can we can essentially go and see if we um, achieve the various goals that we have set ourselves um, in terms of global biodiversity targets, for example, um, like the Convention on Biological Diversity, for example, which sets targets to, to what we want to achieve globally in, in conservation. And so this is really the background of the research unit that I was working in at ZSL, which is uh, aptly named the Indicators and Assessments Unit. So we developed biodiversity indicators and looked at status assessments of species for the IUCN Red List. And really the idea is to start monitoring biodiversity, develop these metrics that we can then kind of um, communicate to the general public, to politicians, to conservationists, and also so that we can start predict what we need to do to actually reverse biodiversity loss, or as um, academics quite often refer to it in a very lofty fashion, I have to say, bending the curve of biodiversity loss. Essentially, what do we need to do to achieve something like this nice green line where, where our rate of loss is, 
is reversed and we're actually kind of stabilizing um, and increasing biodiversity again. And so, yes, as I already said, biodiversity decline has been in the news a lot. These are just two of the stories that came out in 2019 and 2020 that kind of hone in on some of the data that I'll be talking about in the rest of this talk. The first one is this um, report that came out in 2019 by the um, Intergovernmental um, Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or in short, IPBES, uh, which made massive headlines because it was essentially, well, first of all, the most comprehensive assessment of how biodiversity is doing of its kind, but also it came up with this big um, number that one million species are estimated to be threatened with extinction. And this number really is based on, on what we already know based on the IUCN Red List and then extrapolated to what we know the real number of biodiversity, i.e. the number of species on the planet. Um, is, is like. And so this shows already how much traction the Red List has in terms of giving us these, these big um, numbers and headline um, indicators of, of what's happening to biodiversity. The second one is one that's, um, as you can see, much closer to my, my previous home at ZSL, and that's the 2020 Living Planet Report which um, had as a headline that on average, six, uh, there has been a 68% decline in vertebrate population sizes since 1970. And this report gets reissued every other year. So um, we have been seeing these, these dire statistics for a very long time now. And this um, Living Planet report, of course, um, focuses on vertebrate species. So, so fish play a large part in this. Um, and also we will talk a little bit later about some of the freshwater fish um, aspects of this. So really what the Species Survival Commission and, uh, wants to do is to, to avert these losses, avert biodiversity loss, turn the tide, reverse the red is a, an expression that you will hear a lot. Um, and so this is really um, encapsulated in, in how the Species Survival Commission um, tackles its its work and that's as part of the species conservation cycle where we have this large network that we build and build capacity in it that can then assess, plan and act um, for biodiversity. So assess biodiversity and then based on what we find out, carry out conservation planning and action. And then of course, we also talk about it much like I am um, now, communication is a big part of this work. And really the IUCN Red List is very much at the heart of this assess component here. So what is the IUCN Red List? Well, I've kind of semi-jokingly here in the title named it the IUCN Red List of not just threatened species. And uh, of course its official name is the IUCN Red List of threatened species, but really what it does is it provides us a way in which we can classify species according to their extinction risk. And of course the extinction risk of a species could be very low i.e. not threatened, something like least concern, for example, which you can see down here in the bars as, as green. And then yes, as extinction risk in, increases, you get to the threatened categories of vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered, which is when really that's high alert for that species. And ultimately to the two extinct categories, extinct in the wild and extinct. So this is why I kind of jokingly refer to it here as the IUCN Red List of not just threatened species, but it's a, a way in which we can assess any species really according to its extinction risk. And the way we do that really is by pulling together data on, on a number of criteria that relate to symptoms of extinction risk. So for example, if a species has a population that hurtles fast towards lower and lower population sizes, um, that population reduction might be an indication of higher extinction risk. If something is very geographically range restricted, it will have a higher extinction risk than something that's, than something that's widespread. Things that have a small population size and are declining or just have generally a very small or restricted population, for example. And of course, also we could um, have some, some indication in terms of studies on the extinction risk of the species that came out of some, some um, fancy modeling that we've run, for example. And so these criteria then tell us which of these threatened categories our species fall in. 
Now, the IUCN red list has been going for a long time. I already hinted at it that um, generally overall red data books have been going since about 60 years. Um, the current format of the red list really since about 2001 with the current um, categories and criteria that are being used. And really the number of species assessed for it has come a long, come a long way, really. We've very much increased pretty much from a time point in about 2001, 2002, we've increased the number of assessments dramatically. We're now at over 130,000 assessments. Um, and really things like, for example, um, the startup of the um, global freshwater assessment, which started in around 2003, 2004, for example, really have helped to increase the, the knowledge that we hold on the red list. Um, as well, later on, there, were the, there was the global mammal assessment around about 2004, also the global amphibian assessment. And then these various other assessment processes also increasing suddenly for plants and invertebrates, for example, that have really sent this number stratospherically increasing. Stratospheric is probably a big word, but increasing. And so really over the past years, we've started to very much become more um, aware of which species groups are doing particularly well, which aren't, which species need our help and where. And so this, for example, is just a screenshot from some of the summary data that the IUCN produces with every single red list update. Um, essentially here focusing on some of the groups that are for which pretty much all of the species have been assessed, all or nearly all of the species have been assessed in these, in these selected groups. As you can see, it's a selected bony fishes. It's essentially just a few, a few genera or, or families of, of fishes that are in there. Um, so from this already, we can't specifically say anything about freshwater or how fishes are doing in total, but over time, our, our knowledge will increase, particularly as the global freshwater fish assessment is um, moving in, in strides towards the finishing line. So hopefully we will soon have a much better um, idea of how freshwater fishes are doing. The other thing that's interesting and that I really like about the red list is that every so often you get really underappreciated species pop up that really highlight um, what's new in terms of threats to, um, ooh, to species. And that in this case here is this little, little guy in the bottom right hand corner, the scaly foot snail, which was only um, published on the red list, I think two years ago now, and is a hydrothermal vent, so marine mollusk, um, which is highly threatened due to the potential of, of deep sea mining for, for resources. And so this is part of an assessment that's known as the vent red list that's currently also running that really shows that these hydrothermal vents could potentially be under, under a lot of risk. The other thing, of course, that the IUCN red list is very good for is to produce a biodiversity indicator. So these indicators that tell us something about the status and trends of species and that then feed into global biodiversity policy. And so the red list index is one of those indicators. And really what it does is for groups where all the species have been assessed. So say, for example, in 2008, we had a global mammal assessment um, and then we had a repeat assessment of, of the global mammal assessment. So we can produce a red list index for the world's mammals. Um, essentially, all we do is we convert this scale of extinction risk to a numerical scale, um, then do a little bit of math and produce this lovely graph over here where we can see that, for example, anything that's higher up is doing better. So birds are doing better than mammals. Amphibians are doing not that great. Cycads um, are doing really badly of the groups that are currently in the red list index. And we can also see the steep decline that we've seen in corals, for example, over the past years. But of course, this is um, just a snapshot of biodiversity, right? That's mammals, birds, amphibians, and then corals and cycads. Um, what can we do to really um, broaden this? And that's kind of what I've been focusing on when I was working at ZSL. And that's what we call the sampled approach to the Red List Index, which is essentially where we thought, well, there's a lot of mega diverse groups out there. We can't assess all of the species in that group to let us do a red list index. So what is the sample size that we need to randomly take from that species list so that we can 
depict trends over time um, correctly. And so we did a little bit, when I say we, it's the royal we, because um, that was slightly before my time at ZSL. I started in about 2009 there. Um, what my colleagues did prior to this is essentially look at birds that were at, the sta at that stage already comprehensively assessed, just to see how many of those species we would need to pick out to accurately show their red list index. And so what we came up with really was the sample size of 1500 species to buffer against high data deficiency, for example, in some species. And then we could start applying this to many more species. Yeah, you will also see that our idea here in our schematic of biodiversity is a little bit limited. It's a few plant groups. It's um, quite a lot of um, emphasis on invertebrates, but it's really a mixture of comprehensive and sample assessment here that we propose that we should do to get a much more broader view of biodiversity. And it's really, really interesting to see how many of these groups then also started to be uh, freshwater related, like the freshwater mollusks, the freshwater crabs, crayfish and lobsters, and of course fish as well. Although there's a global comprehensive assessment for fish, we also have a sampled assessment of fish. And so some of these groups have now been included in this graph here. You can see that a lot of them only had their initial status assessment done. So we have the crayfish, for example, uh, the crayfish, uh, shrimp, decapod, uh, freshwater crabs, and then here the freshwater fish and the marine fish, for example. Um, marine fish doing better than freshwater fish, for example. So really the IUCN red list, um, yes, is the, at the heart of the assess part of the species conservation cycle. What I would also argue is really at the heart of what comes next, i.e. the planning and the action as well. And so really what is the IUCN Red List ultimately used for? Well, in many ways, what we see in the news, for example, is the outcome of analysis and information that, that this expert network puts out to, to the world about the status of, of biodiversity of species. So this is just a uh, by now very old publication from I think 2008 or 2009 that was looking at the status of, of species on the red list at that stage. Much more importantly, I would say it is the key underpinning a lot of conservation planning and priority setting. If we know how threatened a certain species is, for example, we can prioritize the ones that are more threatened than others. Um, and given the fact that for all of these species we generally also produce um, distribution maps so we know where they are we can also start um, spatial planning for for these species as is depicted here in that in that image i already hinted at it several times because that's my previous background international conservation policy is um is very much a user of the iucn red list and um, this convention on biological diversity has the Red List Index as one of its key indicators to track its progress. Um, the Red List status informs um, a CITES application, for example, for a species, and it also features in the Sustainable Development Goals as, a, as an official indicator. It helps funding. Um, for example, certain funding sources will primarily look at Red List status, for example, on making funding decisions, for example. So it's very important in that respect. More and more becomes important for private sector decision-making. So if there's a project going ahead somewhere, people, well, businesses and, and, and industries will start looking at the red list to see what impact they might be having on the ground. And I suppose coming from a zoo background, um, in my case, um, education and public awareness is a really massive role of the red list. I think the the language used by the categories, for example, critically endangered is really something that, that resonates with, with the public, for example, or endangered or vulnerable. And so it's really a good tool to convey um, threats and status of species to, to the visiting public in zoos. So this is a little bit looking into what can be done in terms of spatially using red list data. Um, and that really is something that has progressed massively. So this is a relatively um, early paper by now. <laughs> it's well, seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, since this was published. And that was really after we had done a few freshwater species assessments, 
um, for freshwater species, um, including amphibians. Um, you can see here in the middle, that's a, a, a river dolphin. <laughs> I don't have a better picture of it, but there you go. Also mammals, you know, underrepresent them a little bit. They get a lot of <laughs> exposure otherwise. Fish, uh, freshwater crabs, reptiles and, and crayfish are included in this analysis. Um, and really what we were looking at was what the spatial picture of, of threat and distribution of range restricted species is for, uh, from these data. So you can see here, for example, this is generally our species richness for this sample of freshwater species that we have, which was more than 7,000 species. We can start looking at where our range restricted species, so where are these distinct hotspots of species that are only found in small areas. Um, and also down here, um, where are our data deficient species that we know very little about. Interesting, when I looked at this again for the purpose of this talk, um, in this case, um, the Amazon area comes up relatively dark blue. And then, of course, where are our threatened species? But this very much is a, is a global analysis. And globally, I suppose, our, our ability to have real fine detail on the map is probably not that great yet, which is why more and more um, assessments have been done at regional or even national status, for example. So here, for example, um, this is from a uh, Eastern Mediterranean freshwater fish assessment that was published in 2014. That was part of the entire Mediterranean basin assessment. And so really what you can see here is what the species richness is. Um, the, the redder the color, the more um, species in a particular basin. And so already we can start seeing where threat is highest um, in terms of what the IUCN Red List tells us. So this was published in 2014. And then um, at the same time also, what the assessment team did was start to look into how what they found would transfer into identifying key biodiversity areas. So areas that are, that are exceptionally important for biodiversity in that region that was assessed. And as you can see here at, the, at this stage, specifically, they were looking at sites that hold a significant number of globally threatened species, for example, or other species of conservation concern. A site known to, to hold non-trivial numbers of, of species with restricted range, for example, or uh, sites that are known to hold significant component of a group of species that is confined to an, a specific unit, for example. So anything that makes these sites particularly um, unique um, were, were highlighted in this assessment. And this is uh, what they found out in 2016, this was published, I believe. Um, and this really is across the entire Mediterranean hotspot region. So again, the red list has played a massive part in this because a lot of it is done based on looking at threatened species status to define these key biodiversity areas. Then, of, of course, what we can do is we can go and see, are these already protected areas or are our key bi biodiversity areas really left at this moment in time to fend for themselves and where should we put more protection in place, for example. In um, 2016, I believe by now, the global standard for the identification of key biodiversity areas was published by the IUCN, which actually kind of set slightly more elaborate, elaborate rules than the ones that were used that I just showed you in the previous slide. Um, and the latest that I could find on freshwater key biodiversity areas is that by 2020, um, over 160 um, key biodiversity areas have been confirmed against this new global standard. And of these ones that were previously identified by the freshwater biodiversity assessment, um, many still require revision. That's, for example, these ones in the Mediterranean basin, in the tropical Andes, Western Ghats, and so on, essentially following where the freshwater biodiversity unit has done regional assessments. They generally now also look at key biodiversity areas, so we can start doing spatial planning. Another field that's really interesting um, and that always intrigues me a lot is, um, I suppose as soon as you declare a species as not having been seen in a very long time, people, people's ears prick up and it becomes this search for lost species. It's like, um, like it, 
links into some competitive element of humanity or something. But um, so we rewild, uh, which was previously known as the global wildlife conservation, um, as global wildlife conservation, um, compiled um, a list of species called the lost species. There were species of animals and plants that are missing to science. And these were really nominated very much by the SSC specialist group experts. And um, because these are the experts that have worked on the species, have in most cases assessed these species for the red list and have noted during their assessments that these species have not been seen in a very long time. And really at a minimum, the criteria was that it should have been unseen by scientists for at least 10 years. And just last week, I was talking to the um, guys from the um, freshwater crustacean specialist group and they again told me about how at least two of the freshwater crabs that they um, said they nominated as lost species have since been rediscovered. Um, this is one of them. And so now what they really want to do is put in conservation action for these lost species um, on the ground. Right, and we move on to edge, which also really has a high, um, well, lives on the impacts of the IUCN red list in many ways. So as Anthony already mentioned in my introduction, the edge of existence, I can't even say that word, the edge of existence program um, is there to prevent the extinction of the world's most evolution evolutionarily distinct and also globally endangered species. And the globally endangered part of this acronym really is has traditionally come from the IUCN Red List because that's our gold standard for assessing the extinction risk or endangerment status of species um, worldwide. The other aspect that fe feeds into this uh, priority setting mechanism is evolutionarily distinctiveness or evolutionary distinctiveness. Um, and this really is trying to factor in how unique a species is. Is it something that only really exists essentially by itself, there's nothing really that's closely related to it. It's very unique. And if we lose that species, it means we lose a particularly long branch of evolutionary history. So in this case, for example, species A here has a much longer unique evolutionary branch or history um, than species B and C. So this would get a higher um, evolutionary distinctiveness score. And then this gets, added to the global endangerment, which we're already very familiar with now, based on the increasing extinction risk of species. And so what the Edge of Existence program, which is based at uh, the, the Zoological Society of London, has um, provided so far are edge lists for mammals, birds, amphibians, corals, reptiles, and sharks. And there's a few more up and coming that I will tell you about in a bit as well. So really some of these top top evolutionary distinct and globally endangered species are this guy, uh, the Western long-beaked echidna, I believe, so from Australia. The plains wanderer also, that's for tops the bird list, that's from Australia. Um, Archie's frog, which is like a, often referred to as a living fossil, it's like a frog from New Zealand that apparently I read recently has a muscle for wagging its tail, but it doesn't have a tail. Um, so really edge species are often these very weird and wonderful critters. Uh, it's got, uh, this is the top coral, um, which I can't pronounce the scientific name of. Um, and then we've got the Madagascar big headed uh, turtle, um, which tops the edge list for reptiles. Although as you can see in this little um, schematic in the middle, it also says featuring the famous punk turtle, and I thought I should explain that's this guy. Um, and when ZSL launched the edge list for reptiles, really this, this guy, the Mary River turtle, um, became very much the poster species for edge reptiles. And it was quite sensational to see how far and wide that picture had been distributed um, with the hashtag punk turtle. And then of course, finally, um, edge sharks which you're probably not surprised to hear that um, the sawfishes really are very much at the top of the list. Um, all five species of sawfish are within the top 
six or seven um, edge species, which is not hugely surprising. <coughs> but what does it mean to be an edge species? I mean, what does that, how does that help you in any shape or form? Um, so the purpose of the Edge of Existence program is then to, once we establish these lists, to start awareness raising about these species and about how weird and wonderful they are, how unique their evolutionary history is, to implement field research for these species, um, and um, also implement conservation actions on the ground. And really at the heart of it is what I really, really think is the strong point of this EDGE program, which is training of conservationists in the field, building conservation capacity within the range countries of these unique and wonderful species. And obviously also fundraising. Um, the great thing here is that currently the applications are open again for the EDGE fellowship. This is this training of conservationists. Um, so every year there's applications for uh, for this EDGE fellowship. At the moment, it's focusing on Asia and Pacific region islands. And also for the first time, um, as you can see here, it includes work on edge fish within the region. And that really brings me to my next point, And that is that um, coming up very soon in the world of, of edge is a, a slight addition or slight um, improvement to how we measure our, our edge score. Um, essentially, we want to go with the times and with scientific knowledge on phylogenetic research and also on um, extinction risk research. Um, so this will, will come up very soon, but then also a, the main event will be that finally an edge fish list will be published. And so already there's a short list of fish species in Asia that um, in-country early career conservationists can apply to to become edge fellows on these species. So that's a really, really great step ahead. Uh, the last thing that I want to quickly talk about is the Living Planet Index. Um, I often prefix this with, um, yes, there's the IUCN red list and the red list index, but other indicators are available. And so this is another indicator that we worked on at ZSL. I already mentioned it previously um, in 2020, the headline was 68% average decline in species population sizes since 1970. Now, this is usually the thing that gets the headline. And what really baffles me very much is that when you then look at the freshwater part of the Living Planet Index, we see even bigger declines. In this case, um, average abundance change of 84%, so 84% decline since 1970. Yet quite often this doesn't necessarily make the headlines, which frustrates me greatly because I find this statistic seriously frightening. However, this year there has been, well, this year, last year now in 2020, there has been for the first time a proper separate segment on the freshwater LPI the Freshwater Living Planet Index, and that hopefully will be something that will be improved on in future years as well. Just quickly, what is the Living Planet Index? It essentially is an amalgamation of time series data, so data over time for species that are monitored in particular lo locations in the world. Um, so population trends, say, from sea turtles on a particular beach in some tropical country, let's say Costa Rica, <laughs> on a specific Costa Rica beach, there will be nest counts or something like this year on year, and this time series goes into the Living Planet database. Um, so it's these time series for vertebrate species that have been monitored, of course, not just once, but several times, at least twice, but generally over longer time periods. And then various additional data on most importantly, of course, where the species is, where that population is that's been um, monitored. Uh, something about its ecology. So is it fresh water, for example? So we can do a fresh water cut really quickly. Um, and also about its threats. So here, for example, what are the main threats, for example, and so on. There's a large number of, of data that's uh, attached to this, which then means that we can do subcuts of this database, like the Freshwater Living Planet Index, for example. 
The other thing that came out in 2020, and now we're getting fishy again and fresh water, um, is um, the first Living Planet Index for migratory freshwater fish. And that actually also got a lot of press attention. So this again uses the same LPI methodology, the same Living Planet method. Um, in this case, of course, just on a subset of the species that are in our database that are freshwater and are migratory. And this has shown an average change in abundance of 76% uh, between 1970 and 2016. Um, and this is just to show how many uh, monitored populations have gone into this data set and how many species they represent. And so hopefully as um, we increase this database on vertebrate species um, and their time series over time, then hopefully we can also produce better and also more subcuts of this database to really tell us about very specific parts of biodiversity and how they're doing. And so with this really it comes back to, to the, uh, one of the original slides looking at this bending the curve of biodiversity loss or as it's probably, well, it's more known in, in SSC and IUCN uh, circles, reverse the red, uh, which is kind of pretty much means the same thing. We want, to, we want to stop biodiversity loss and we want to turn things around to improve. And really um, the IUCN red list, for example, edge lists, biodiversity indicators and so on really can help us with tracking the status and trends of species like freshwater fish, for example, Amazon and Amazon freshwater fish LPI would be excellent to have in future. Um, and then put in the appropriate plans and action to reverse what we're seeing, which will then in turn again, hopefully reflect in our biodiversity indicators. And so this is a very quick whistle stop tour of how IUCN red lists and edge lists and biodiversity indicators are used. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing now as well. Sounds good to me. Thank you, Monica, for your presentation. So we have a um, series of questions. Uh, the first question um, I'd like you to um, go over was the question from Matt Kaufman, the, the question I sent you about uh, what's happening with uh, Brazilian killifish and how um, exporters and importers are being arrested and all their stuff being seized. Uh, so could you uh, address that question first? Yes, yeah. So for, I don't know if, if the entire group is aware of the story that broke. Um, it was essentially a seizure of, of killifish, I believe in the US. Um, essentially brought about by the Brazilian government, I believe, on, on fish that were thought to be illegal in that sense. I'm not very good at paraphrasing the, the news story. And I think this is part of my, my response to this. I do remember that we, we did discuss this with my colleagues. Um, the problem is that at the moment we have very little information on what that news story actually is. And it's very difficult to make heads and tails of it, particularly because we don't even really know what species were involved in this. There's obviously lots of killifish species out there and we don't really know um, specifically what species it is that were that were traded. I think the difficulty here is um, that while of course the IUCN red list gives you this um, system to assess threat of species and so on, it is then down to political decision makers quite often to see what they do with the information. And obviously also conservationists in terms of conservation action and, the, and so on, but quite often, um, quite often then it is, uh, it forms um, the basis for protected species lists, for example, which um, specifically it's, well, which is essentially how countries interpret what they see on the red list, for example, or on the national red list as well. So I do not know what the status of these killifish species, for example, is in Brazil. I think the difficulty here is that I, it's very important. I think the take home message is very important to always be aware of whatever the situation is in terms of licenses that one needs to bring fish out of a country, uh, which I, again, also, I'm 
who was looking into it and could not find any information on any of the web pages of the Brazilian government for these particular fish. And I think the other part of the question was how um, the IUCN could work more with hobby aquarists um, to, because quite often it's these aquarists, right, who, who know probably much more about some of these species. Um, some of the species that have been in a, the aquarium community have not even necessarily yet been um, properly described by scientists, for example. So um, I think it's very important that we diversify our expert network within IUCN and the SSC. And that's actually something that we're trying to push forward. Um, so, sorry, I was just distracted by looking, by reading other questions, which is very bad as they pop up. So I think, I think there is a, a role for uh, aquarists to play within the expert networks. Um, expertise, as we quite often say, comes in a lot of different disguises. Um, it's not just academic um, expertise, but also, you know, how do you breed these things ex situ, for example? How can you keep captive populations going? And, and aquariums and zoos, for example, are getting more and more involved now in IUCN work because of precisely this. And I think getting hobbyists involved is also really important. Okay, I'm just reading none of the confiscated lists are on the IUCN red list as, yeah. Yeah, quite often it then also depends, not necessarily what's on the red list, but what's on the um, essentially do not um, export from this country list in Brazil. And I really do not know what the situation currently is and what, what species are on that list and what which ones aren't. Um, it's a It's a very interesting situation. And if anybody here knows more about it, because we have been talking about this in the Freshwater Conservation Committee, it would be really cool to get more information on this because we just couldn't make heads or tails of it. Um, yes, so Matt, uh, if you could email Monica the information that you have, uh, she would appreciate that. I mean, that would help their group. Uh, yeah, totally, because at this moment in time, it's very difficult to find out real specifics about it. Um, at least I found that I we, we tried and it's just very difficult to find the right information. So if you've got anything else, that would be really, really good to see. Because generally the consensus was like, what, killing fish? I mean, there's so many. Are they threatened? Hmm. <laughs> What's going on here? It sounds a little bit dubious. I, I do have a question as a moderator. I, you know, it's my priority to <laughs> mine above everybody else's. Um, it's a question you hear from the public, not necessarily from scientists, not necessarily from people who are concerned about animals, but the question of statement is, you know, Extinction is a natural process. Species have gone extinct for millions of years. Why should we be so worried about species going extinct since it is a natural process? I already know the answer, but <laughs> what, what, how would you answer that to the public, to you know, Jane Doe on the street who comes up and says, we're spending millions of dollars trying to save the desert pupfish here in California. <laughs> Well, yeah. big deal let it go yeah it's uh, i mean it's it's obviously uh, true that extinctions are are a fact of of life um and of happens happens has happened over time again and again but the rates of extinction that we currently are seeing are unprecedented and also the other essentially kind of at the level of what could be classed as, as going into a mass extinction. So when we kind of think back of some of these really devastating extinction events. And the other interesting fact, of course, about this particular extinction event is that um, it's driven for once by a single species, and that would be humans. We have had a massive impact on our planet. Um, pretty much can be seen by, I think, only about 25% now is classed as, as true wilderness. Um, everywhere else you can see human footprint and human impact. And while, yes, extinctions are a fact of life and do happen, the other thing, of course, that we're risking by seeing vast amounts of extinction happening is that we could start losing the functioning of our ecosystems. This is when I kind of started becoming really interested in some of the little things, the little critters that really, as I would call it, make the world go round. Well, not quite, but they, they keep our ecosystems and habitats going. Um, they, 
they filter our fresh water, they um, sequester carbon for us, um, they store carbon for us, they regulate our climate, they keep our soils healthy. And I think as soon as we start losing too many species, and we don't know at what stage that point is in many cases, at what stage our ecosystem functioning would be seriously compromised, for example, in many cases. I think we just shouldn't run the risk of it. This is also what keeps what makes me feel really worried about these statistics about freshwater threat is that I think we all require fresh water and here, here we go. Um, we see that clearly something isn't right um, in a resource that we all require. So it's quite worrying. So these would be my, was it two or three reasons that I gave? <laughs> Can't <Okay>. remember. <laughs> uh, here's a question from Matt and you mentioned it uh, in your talk a little bit. Um, his question is, what's the relationship between the IUCN Red List and CITES? So the IUCN Red List status of species really does inform um, CITES listings, as far as I am aware. So if you want to propose a species for CITES, um, you obviously have to kind of a, a government generally or a CITES member which generally is the governments, uh, would have to put together a, um, a application in many ways for this. It's probably not called this, um, but I'm not very good in my political lingo. Um, and, and the threatened status of a species, so the extinction risk status of a species is one part of the information that, that really kind of feeds into CITES of whether or not uh, specific restrictions are needed. Um, so it's essentially, it informs the CITES um, application process. And since individual governments control CITES for their country, they can disregard any information, correct? Um, I, now it gets very political how to be, um, how to phrase this. I, I would assume they can, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's how, how political decisions are made is, um, I suppose, um, a different kettle of fish, pardon the pun, altogether. Okay. Uh, Rich Byerly um, has a question about um, the species that are being assessed. When, when you assess species for IUCN or any, you know, species assessment, uh, does this include uh, individual populations uh, or subspecies, or does it include all, you know, all variations of that species. Yeah, so you can assess um, things for the red list. Um, I call them things right now, so taxa at different levels. So generally, the the base unit really for the for the red list is the species level, and that at a global level. That's kind of what the IUCN traditionally, the IUCN red list has traditionally been assessing. But it's also possible to assess subspecies, uh, subpopulations. Uh, varieties when you go into the plant world, for example, that becomes quite quite important. Um, and then, of course, also there's a, a new massive branch of red listing, which is um, producing national or regional red lists, which then also look at like kind of a, a subset of of a species range in many ways based on on the nation borders, for example. So so there's many more processes available, and specifically for the global red list, yes, subpopulation, subspecies, all possible. Oh, I'm just reading the comments. Because yeah. he says, they, he asks that because the bird list in, seems to include more species that are currently recognized, he thinks. Yeah, I think there's also currently, now I'm not a bird expert. <laughs> I just want to prefix everything with this. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I often refer refer to birds to my colleagues as they're just funny looking reptiles. Um, but um, I think um, I think there's also currently some taxonomic um, conversations going on regarding birds. So I think that could also be part of this. Okay. Um, because there has been a recent revision, I think, and now it's like which which taxonomy does one follow? I think that could could be part of this, but like I say, my bird knowledge is very minimal. Yeah, you know, that's, fish people tend to be that way. You know, and <laughs> the non-charismatic species people like we are. Um, yeah, 
You, you mentioned this briefly. Uh, Melly Huang wants to know, does a trend line, uh, what does a trend line for freshwater fish look like in particular? Uh, you did show that 84% decline in freshwater fish species or the numbers. So that probably is that trend line that we're having this dramatic decrease in the overall abundances of freshwater fishes around the world. Yeah, that, that um, freshwater LPI trend line will also involve other, include other freshwater species of the vertebrate realm. So it could be that it's some freshwater mammals in there as well. Um, maybe some freshwater associated birds and amphibians. So um, most of it will most likely be fish, um, but it would be really good to start um, disentangling this. Um, actually, what we're trying to start up well, hopefully very soon, because we just got um, a potential um, little uh, research intern over the summer, is to start looking at, at really what's in our freshwater living planet database and where are the gaps and, and how can we balance what we see in that better. And I think part of this will then also mean that we can establish a proper freshwater fish trend line from this exercise. So watch this space. Okay. Uh, another question by Rich. Rich and uh, Matt are, you know, one of our frequent aspirants <laughs> of questioners. Uh, is a choice of species assessment driven at all by threats? Uh, construction of dams, uh, obvious loss of habitat due to anthropogenic activity. So is that one of the drivers of the assessments? Or the problem in that is that we don't know what a pre-assessment number looks like. You know, one of the things I've often, you know, when I look at interactions of species, you only look at it after a new species comes into play. You don't know what it was to begin with. And, and so, you know, to me, that's one of the drawbacks of some of these species assessments. So when, when IUCN does these species assessment, is it driven by the fact that there may be a change going on in the environment? Um, I think it could be a, a number of different approaches. So a lot of these, big global um, level assessment, like for example, the IUCN's Freshwater Biodiversity Unit, they essentially set themselves the task of running a global freshwater assessment and specifically also fo focusing on fish and that will hopefully draw to a conclusion very, very soon. Um, and they essentially just went region by region because their target is to assess all of the fish of the world. Um, for specific specialist groups, for example, I could see scenarios where they would focus on specific threats, for example. Um, spiders, for example, uh, the, the spider group, not the spiders themselves, um, they've started, for example, looking at traded tarantulas, for example, because there is a specific need to figure out their status, also because they're potentially important for, for CITES listing and so on. Um, for for uh, for that's again a freshwater group so that's primarily again following the freshwater assessment method but so for example for the mollusks the idea of doing the hydrothermal vent red list was specifically coming from a need that um, deep sea mining is becoming a big threat for these species and that we had to act fast to figure out what actually we could stand to lose and so this was very much an assessment process that was driven by there is this overriding threat what does that mean for vent endemic species, for example. So I think it's a it's a mixture depending on what the the end goal of that assessment is. And I think particularly for specialist groups, it could be that it's quite often that there's specific conservation issues that they want to address and hence they run those assessments first. Okay. Uh, another uh, question from Matt, um, multi-pronged question. Um, how do you, when, when you do geographic assessments of species, how do you do that when species have or naturally have limited ranges? So are they more endangered or more possibility than those that have a wider range? He gives an example of a, a brown trout in North America. They're found all over the place where the devil's hole pupfish is found in one habitat uh, that is critically endangered and giraffes in Africa versus uh, killifish, he uses Notobranca gutheri as the example where mm -hmm. these killifishes are found in these small isolated pools um, that are naturally temporary habitats. So you would expect the 
isolated populations to be ranked higher than one that has a larger geographic range. Is that is that how it's done in the IUCN? Yeah, so I mean, extinction risk theory, I suppose, that underlies this this assessment, this criteria system would, of course, stipulate that something that occurs in a much smaller range has a higher extinction risk simply by random things could happen in that range that could drive it to extinction as opposed to having a large range like, say, the gray wolf that kind of ranges across all of the northern hemisphere or something like this. Um, and so, um, yes, that does factor in. Um, it's not quite as simple as that. So it's not just restricted range size that is um, part of these criteria. I just skimmed over this early on. But if you look at something that has a restricted range, you also would look at some other factors that happen to this species. So for example, is the species declining within that range? So the population declining? Or is the area that it, that it occurs in declining so is its range contracting really over time or is the habitat extent declining within its range for example and and also to a certain degree what are the threats to that species and how do, do the threats really have an impact um, or really impact how isolated or how restricted that, that species is for example so for example some 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 threats could be very highly localized and the species might be more widely widely um, um, ranging than, than these localized threats. So it probably would need a lot of localized threats to impact the entire species range. Whereas in other cases, for example, it's so restricted that one threat could, could essentially wipe it out. And so these things are taken into, into account in these assessments as well. Okay. Um... <laughs> Sorry, that was a very quick, very quick and, and dirty explanation of a really complicated criterion. <laughs> Um, he has a question about edge species. Are edge species special to the IUCN or just to the Zoological Society of, of, Lon of London? And so edge species are just an example of using IUCN data? Yeah, and yeah, is absolutely. It, is it so just the Z, as we would say in America? We don't know what Z is. is <laughs> yeah, sorry. Is it? Is it <laughs> a ZSL data that uses IUCN data? Yes, absolutely. So the, the Edge of Existence program came about, I think the original paper was probably published in about 2007, 2008 or something, um, which was um, uh, colleagues of mine. Well, once I started, they became colleagues of mine who put together the Edge metric and came up with it at ZSL, at ZSL. <laughs> um, and, um, Really, it's it's because we wanted to develop a prioritization scheme that we at, at, at ZSL can use to to advance conservation that looks at evolutionary distinct species. And we just wanted to factor in how endangered things are, because that obviously will also mean how we should prioritize them. So this is a way to show how the IUCN Red List information can be used to also build other metrics. Interestingly, though, now um, there's also a phylogenet phylogenetic diversity task force in the Species Survival Commission. So the edge metric and this whole thinking about phylogenetic diversity as well has uh, gotten much more traction, I think, in the conservation world now. So starting out from ZSL, I think it's starting to spread a bit more. And also the the upcoming gymnosperm list, for example, that was primarily developed by our collaborators at Kew, Kew Gardens, Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew. Okay, thank you. Question from Kim Haywood uh, from the UK. Um, <laughs> Mani, this is fascinating, thank you. Uh, looking at the map, the trends every day, are you personally frustrated or optimistic that the public slash governments are getting the message? Oh, this depends very much on, on daily mood, I think, to be quite honest. I have days when I kind of think, we can do this, we can totally do this, it will be fine. And other days where I just kind of think, oh God, why? Um, so I think it is um, very much, from a personal standpoint, depends on my daily mood and how much exposure to sunlight I had, I think. Um, but in many ways, my official reply would be to remain upbeat because there's nothing, um, 
you don't lose anything by 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 trying to to spread the message that I think we can still turn this around. It will most likely be a changed biodiversity that we see out there because we've had quite a massive impact. But I think it's still possible to keep systems running so that they can support us all, all of us living, well, still living organisms on this on this world. Um, so I think it's it's still possible to turn this around, particularly, well, it depends obviously how you define what your turning around point is. I don't think we can conserve everything that's that's here. Things will go extinct. A, that's a matter of nature it happens but also because some things have so far gone by now that it's probably impossible to, to save them but i think if we for example focus on on keeping ecosystems going that are still functional and still provide all of the relevant services to us and to other species and i think that's still possible that's a really roundabout way of saying sometimes i sit on the fence <laughs> so th this this is a question uh that goes to your optimism from uh, Chuck Billow. Uh, while it's important to keep up optimism like you have um, so that we work hard for conservation, how do you feel about communicating the realism that the sixth mass extinction event will mean the wiping out of probably 90 percent and above of the species that are known right now? Yeah, or, I mean, that exist on Earth. Yeah. Yeah, in many ways, um, through my previous post, I was very much part of the pessimistic gang simply by the kind of data that we collated for the sample red list index and also for the living planet index, right? Most of the time we report on things are declining, right? So I always felt a little bit guilty because, you know, when we had like media releases or something, people probably just sit at home, eat their breakfast cereal, and then we come on again and say how everything's going down the drain and, you know, how terrible it is. And so really we've been grappling with this, with this, how do you best phrase it for a very long time? Because of course, what you don't want to, you have to be realistic, but you also don't want to be um, so downtrodden that you lose everybody because everybody just goes like, well, what's the point in even caring, right? That's that's one extreme. You also don't want to kind of say everything's fine because it's clearly not. So it's this very difficult um, balancing act that you have to be on, I think, for to really kind of make sure that the message comes across. And I think it's very important we talk about conservation successes because it's very important to show that things can be done. And there are some really excellent um, success stories it's also equally important to keep to realism. Um, so I think it's a balancing act. Um, our, our saving grace at some point, I call it that, um, after we had a lot of news that was just, oh, look, the LPI is going down and going down even faster than previously. And look, 30% of freshwater mollusks or something are threatened with extinction. Isn't it all bad? Um, we did a project looking at wildlife comeback in Europe using, again, the Living Planet database, for example. And specifically looking at what are the reasons why some species have now bounced back. So is it better protection or is it is it land abandonment? These kind of things that are currently happening in vast parts of, of rural Europe, for example. And so this was a really nice change because for, for suddenly we could start about positive news. And I think that's also really important because suddenly that story was taken up by the media again as well. I think if you if you have too much bad news, you probably don't quite get the space anymore to talk about it because we've all been a little bit overloaded. So I think it's getting the balance again also helps to keep the public engaged, I think, and the press engaged and the politicians engaged. Okay. Um, another question comment from Rich is that um, general information available to the public seems to indicate very few species exist, uh, extinctions overall, you know, for whatever reason, you know, if you look at how many species have gone extinct within our lifetime, you know, we look at it since the beginning, it's astronomical. Um, and this, you know, the idea that the, the total numbers of species that have gone extinct are small is often used to negate this idea we need more conservation efforts and that uh, species are in, in big trouble. Um, what number does the ICU, IUCN think are extinct? And how should we communicate this information better to the public? 
that's that's a really good that's a really good question so um i was just about to google how many species are now currently on the iucn red list as extinct it's it's correct it's actually not such an enormous number that you could look at it and go like but there's no problem there right there's not that many species that we have officially listed as as extinct part of the problem of course is that we're very careful to not list species as extinct when they're not yet extinct. It's very difficult to prove extinction, essentially, it's, it's, it's the first point. Um, and so for the IUCN Red List to actually list something as extinct, we would have had to have extensive surveys for that species that was specifically targeted at using, you know, the same, uh, the, 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 the best methods to detect this species, uh, going several times, going at the appropriate time of the year to find that species and so on, and really document how we have put effort in to go and find that species but haven't found it. So there's there's also a lot of species on the red list that are currently listed as what we call critically in, endangered but possibly extinct. I, we have already done a lot of um, surveys, haven't really found that species. Um, the other thing that I find um, that I think is important to communicate is that quite often when these species get to the threatened categories or critically endangered specifically, we're already talking about something that has declined massively or is really just in a tiny, tiny place and probably has really low population sizes. And so in many ways, particularly if we start thinking about um, ecosystem function again, quite a lot of these depleted species probably don't can't carry out whatever they were carrying out for for healthy ecosystems anymore because they come to a to a level where their impact is going to be negligible so i would and this i think is the strength of the living planet index as opposed to the red list index and they kind of complement each other really um, is that in the living planet index we do start to see how quite abundant species are also declining and really that also i find incredibly worrying because although there might still be least concern and so on, they're less abundant and then probably also um, provide less of a function or a role within their ecosystem as they get diminished. So that's also another thing that that is worrying to me and comes way before actual extinction. Okay. So just depleted biodiversity, I think, is also not a good thing for us, for okay. us all <laughs> species and well, we are a species, so all species alike. Okay, thank you. Um, question from J.Y. Kiermoy. I'm not sure if, you know, that's a full name. Uh, the decline of freshwater fish populations, not only due to overexploitation habitat loss, uh, but also due to absence of any specific planning, management planning, conservation planning for these species. So what is the future planning of GCSS? <laughs> and what, and oh. what is GCSS for, for those of us who do not know what GCSS is? Yeah, that's, that's a lot of questions all rolled in one. So starting with the simplest, the GCSS is uh, really brand new and I want to re-emphasize this because we're currently just working on our work plan so I can't really quite say what our specific um, focus will be. Um, but just to quickly give you the background, the Global Center for Species Survival, which I've, I've joined in February this year, is essentially this brand new partnership between the Species Survival Commission and Indianapolis Zoo. And the remit of that center is to support the work of the um, species specialist groups of the, of the IUCN. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the talk, for example, a lot of these specialist groups are run by people who give their time voluntarily, they're not being paid for this. Um, they're species experts, they care about their species and they want to achieve action on the ground and, and make things better for the species under their remit. And so what, what has been over the past years um, identified as one of the issues is that um, these specialist groups need better support they need they need um, more people power behind them really to 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 bring out the best in them to really make them make them um function at their best um, for species conservation and so this is going to be the role of the global center of species survival is that we will support these various species groups um, specialist groups so my role as freshwater conservation coordinator for example is to to specifically under work um, with the freshwater relevant groups 
it could be that, for example, it means that we start bringing groups, uh, specialist groups uh, who work in similar regions together for some concerted conservation planning, for example, um, or some concerted conservation action. Specifically, what it what our work plan will be, we don't know yet. What we've just started doing is reach out to specialist groups and ask them what is it specifically that you need most to function at your best. And so this will all become a lot clearer over the next few months. Um, but ultimately it is to make sure that most of our specialist groups can start moving from primarily doing assessments towards the planning and action stage of this conservation cycle, because that's what we need to reverse the red, right? Or bend the curve of biodiversity loss. Um, and so this is really going to be our task is to think strategically how we can get the best out of this network and how to support them best. Okay. And uh, that was the, um, the last question. So thank you, uh, Monica, for a very informative and educational presentation. Um, we have posted Monica's uh, email uh, in the chat. So if, you, if there's any other questions that you have for her, feel free to uh, email her. Uh, we will, oh, one last comment. Uh oh, so I'm sorry, Matt Kaufman has one last comment. And that was, what is your comment there, Matt? I think, I think he's typing. <laughs> oh, he's typing? Oh, well, okay. Please don't underestimate the contribution of skilled ACRIS uh, when you make uh, these conservation for conservation worldwide. Uh, that, that's true. I mean, uh, at heart, uh, I'm a scientist, but it really at heart, I'm a home ACRIST. You know, that's what got me into science. And that's what is really the drive behind our research center is looking at these ornamental fishes and looking at the conservation status and trying to sustainably breed these uh, ornamental species that are that may be critically endangered or, or on their way. So yes, I, I agree that um, especially with some of these very unique species that uh, that aren't that, that are hard to breed, sometimes the home acarist can break down and figure out how to breed these species uh, very sustainably. So so yes, that's very correct. Yeah, no, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. I think, um, I think traditionally, the IUCN or the Species Survival Commission has been very much um, coming from a research type background. And I think particularly as we want to move, and this is probably also why a lot of it has been focusing on the assessment side of things and the building the scientific knowledge base for for conservation. But as we want to move to to planning and action, I think it's very important to get to get much more diverse um, expertise and abilities into these various um, components and, and specialist groups to be quite honest. So I, I fully agree. And we did a species assessment at some point on, on cone snails, which was quite interesting because it also um, included a lot of cone snail collectors who were just um, quite often, obviously you would kind of get these, why collectors, is that the best thing? It is because it's also in their interest that their species are doing well, right? That's, that's, that's what their whole um, business model hinges on. And so um, I think um, it was really fascinating to see also the amount of information that they could actually bring to the assessment, which was probably in many cases more than some academic researchers. And I thought that was fascinating. So I think we need to diversify our membership sure, I, and I the agree. involvement of people. Yeah, I agree. Um, so just for those, uh, for information, um, this talk will be available on YouTube probably by Monday. Um, and so I, you know, I have to do some fixing to put it into um, iMovie to, to be able to upload it into YouTube. So it should be available by Monday morning at the at the latest. Um, let's say eight eight a.m. California time. Um, but you know, don't quote me on that. Um, so I want to again thank you, Monica, for your presentation, and, and to our audience that we've had uh, these past couple months. Thank you for attending our venture into the virtual world to begin with. Uh, this is the last presentation for the spring. Um, we should, uh, we will 
started again in September uh, once we uh, return from Peru to the research center. Uh, we'll keep people posted on our YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook on what's happening in Peru. Um, and, and also our website, if you want like more information, go to our website, amazonresearchcenter.org. Uh, we are a nonprofit 5013C organization. Uh, support, your support is critical to our future and much appreciated. And we are thankful for all the donors that we've had for the research center. So again, thank you all. Uh, we appreciate your attending this talk and we hope you will come to our future talks. So thank you very much.